it's hard to know where to start. Certainly reading declassified FBI files had many surprising moments. Um, reading through pianist Ray Lev's files, the FBI began surveilling Ray after Red Channels was published. She was a classically trained pianist and progressive who'd worked with a range of civil rights organizations. She said that as a minority herself, she had an obligation to fight for civil rights for all minorities. For nearly 20 years, the Bureau went through her trash, monitored her travel, prevented her from getting a passport so she could perform in Europe. Um, and reading this file gave me a deep sense of how ruinous the Red Scare was for people. The last entry in the file was a detailed account of Lev's suicide in 1967 and a note that the file could now be closed. Listeners, that's author and scholar Dr. Carol Stabile sharing some of her thoughts about a 10-year journey of research into FBI files and the toxic masculinity we now know fueled the Red Scare and anti-communist blacklisting. If you thought that the topic of blacklisting had been exhausted, Well, there was at least one stone that had remained unturned until very recently, and that is the impact that blacklisting had on the budding TV industry, and more specifically, women. This season, four episodes in all, of Advanced TV Herstory includes segments of an extended interview with Dr. Stabile and dozens of names you've never heard of. You'll also hear from another scholar and author, Dr. Charlene Register. Listen in on our frank conversation about how racism further changed the course of early TV. You won't find this anywhere else. This is Advanced TV History, and I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. It's an honor for me to talk today with Carol Stabile. And we, oh, listeners, we are in for so much fun. We are going to talk about blacklisting and anti-communism and sexism, the way it was handed out in in spades back in the 40s and 50s, and the impact that that has on TV today. Carol Stabile, welcome to Advance TV History. Thank you so much for, for having me today. We want to know, first and foremost, how it is that you ended up with a PhD and do all sorts of teaching about women and media. Well, can I just say, th- these questions were so wonderful, and it gave me an opportunity to think about things and be self-reflexive about things I hadn't thought about for a long time. So I'll just start by saying that from the time I was small, I was a binger on literature, film, television, and I grew up consuming popular culture of all kinds. Now, I hesitate to say this because it often derails the conversation, but I also grew up in a Western theme park. And you grew up in a Western theme park. Yes, that's true. And I think that that also meant that from the time I was very small, I thought a lot about how the perspective of the storyteller shapes the stories that they, or in the case of the Western, more often than not, he tells. So I grew up in this place that celebrated the genre of the Western, and it was a place that also celebrated white masculinity, right? Okay, where is this? (laughs) (laughs) It's in northwestern New Jersey. Wow. And so I lived in the world where the only women in the stories were were big-hearted prostitutes or downtrodden wives slash domestic servants. Um, No one really talked about Annie Oakley then. And the world of the Western was also like deeply racist and genocidal as well. So this is the the kind of stew I swam in as a child. And uh, in school, I studied literature that shared many of the same characteristics. Um, So I, you know, I remember thinking, how can you write a novel that's 585 pages long and not even mention women? And I love Melville as much as the next person, but it struck me that, you know, it was a real problem reading and consuming all this media that was told from one perspective. And that was a perspective that was very predictably white and male. So then I wound up through a a series of, I mean, call it misadventures, getting a PhD in English with a focus on culture and media. And when I when I got to the campus where I got my PhD, it was on the heels of a huge sex discrimination lawsuit. And the sex discrimination lawsuit changed the face of the campus that I entered. So they had to hire all these women. 
there was a sense in the air, it was very palpable at the time of, you know, all these feminist researchers um, writing books, thinking about gender, thinking about race, thinking about, you know, about the canon and how exclusionary it was and how the material that was being taught in courses really kind of focused, again, on the experiences of this one group. And so that's where I got my PhD, and I somehow, stupidly, foolishly, maybe thought that the world would look like that, right? But it was a very particular place, a very particular, you know, moment in time. Um, so I think that my interest in media industries grew out of this real interest in what was not being told and what was being excluded from the stories that I was watching on TV, the stories I was seeing on the screen, and also the materials I was teaching as a new professor that, again, really just kind of narrowly focused on one set of experiences. So you were kind of a cultural gap analyst of sorts. Yeah, you know, that's funny that you say that because I think at one point I said, you know, I just feel like all I see are gaps. Someone's got to see them, right? And, and that's usually where opportunity is. You know, yeah. I we often use the phrase that is wrongly attributed to Wayne Gretzky, that you should skate to where the puck is going, not where it's been. Yeah. And what is that other than recognizing uh, trajectory mm-hmm. and, and recognizing what could be? So, gosh, the, the layers that we're going to get into, uh, listeners, are really exciting. We will be talking about McCarthyism and what that really meant for all creative people in the United States in the 40s and 50s, how that even came to be, because it's not something too many people know about. They just know that all of a sudden it happened. And it's not like a bad cold. It didn't just happen. It, there, was a, there was a real buildup. And most importantly, we are going to talk about how it is that that entire ism of McCarthyism and the anti-communist fervor that happened that swept through industries changed careers, and it changed particularly the careers of women. And that's important because we certainly recognize that once you are branded as being difficult to work with, it's awfully hard to shake that. And that's not just for women wanting to be working back in the industry that they started in, but also how other women don't want to work with women who are branded difficult. Unless, of course, you're a difficult woman, in which case, perhaps, you're okay with wanting to surround yourself with other difficult women if you can just get past that storming norming and performing stage yes there's a there's a little bit of leadership and organizational development for you all right so the premise of these this entire series is working on carol's book which was just published in 2018 and it's called the broadcast 41 women and the anti-communist blacklist so, Carol, before we get into the book, though, your, um, your origin of interest in TV and film and these gaps, before you really started realizing that there was a book in all of this, what other sorts of things were you teaching with regard to TV and women and film? You know, I, I should say that, that my PhD is in English, and so, um, you know, I was really inspired as a, as a scholar by the work of, of people like Mary Helen Washington, Susan Gubar, and Sandra Gilbert, Michelle Wallace, and many, many others who were, who were looking at the ways in which women were excluded from literature. If you take the case of Mary Helen Washington, um, we study black feminist or black women's literature today in part because of the work of recovery that she did Mm -hmm. in the 1970s. Um, When I started thinking about about television and media, you know, even though all this work was happening in fields like English and literature in the 1980s, it never has really happened in in broadcast historiography or or film historiography. And so I, I think that partly I saw that particular gap too. And I thought, well, why aren't we, I know that there were women working in the industry. We know the names of some women and there's some famous women, but why don't we know more about, about the groups of women who are making inroads into film and television in the 1930s and 1940s? You know, more recently, I've been teaching some of the material from from the book as a way of encouraging people to study and think about these women, because I think part of what your podcast do and part of what my book was aimed to do was to to teach people who teach and think about media um, about the presence and the work of people who'd been erased from that history. 
that is really interesting because it, it seeds into uh, listeners. If you were around and and or have had the chance to listen to the Athena Film Festival episode from 2018, kind of late winter, early spring of 2018. And I pulled some audio from the Athena Film Festival, which was held on the campus of Barnard College in New York. The conversation around uh, changing the canon, changing the perspective from which stories are told. And in order for, for us to really truly appreciate and have representation and equity of women's experiences and stories that involve women, it also requires us to have women actually doing the storytelling, not just directing and producing, but also in writing. And so that was a great conversation, which doesn't come up often. It, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty bold person who says, and who can discern that a story or a movie is, is of one quality because it was largely generated by men. And not, and not be branded some, you know, hating person. Mm-hmm. The important part I think that we can sit here today and talk about is that we're not hating the people who developed all of this. It developed, it happened, and there's no changing that amount of history. We can, however, hypothesize what those gaps would have looked like if they hadn't existed, if women had been allowed to fulfill the careers that they had wanted to, if the industry of entertainment had been a little bit more based on merit and a little less on a struggle for power and uh, pursuit of money. So it's, a, it's kind of a deep subject, and it is one that takes into account understanding of feminism, not just of the current feminism or of how, whichever, however many waves you define feminism, but taking it all the way back to a profound time in American history, World War II, and what was going on with, with the opportunities for women, how they broke open. And because we have a professor in the house, we're going to find out more about that. Who did you write the book for, Carol? I really wrote the book for people who write and think about television history. I wish I could say it was a fast-paced thriller, but claims I make in the book are original and controversial, and so I knew I needed to get it right, right? If you're going to write a book that's critical of institutions like the FBI, for example, you have to have all your facts in order. And I was writing this, um, you know, I, I'm not even going to tell you how long I've been, I was writing this book for because it was a very long time, but I was really mindful of the responsibility I had um, to the facts and also to um, the truth of what these women's experiences. So I spent a lot of time reading their papers and trying to use their own voices in the writing of the book rather than using them to ventriloquize my arguments. I asked Dr. Stabile to provide a brief context of the Red Scare and anti-communism, knowing that her years of reading FBI files would deliver the freshest description ever. There are whole books that have been written about the Red Scare. And if you're interested after listening to my short version, I really love historian Ellen Schrecker's Many Are the Crimes, McCarthyism in America. But I'll give you my very short version of what happened in television in particular in the years between 1946 and 1955. Um, the anti-communist movement led by the FBI and its former agents, financially supported by the Catholic Church, orchestrated a campaign against progressives across media industries with particular interest in folks that they thought were likely to work in television. Television was very much a new medium at that point in time. And one of the characteristics of this period, especially on the part of progressives, is this enormous hope that television is going to provide opportunities to promote tolerance to educate people, to further the cause of democracy. And you have to keep in mind that these are this is a generation that's been traumatized by World War II, by the horrors of the war, revelations about the Holocaust, and then the, the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, so there's this real kind of groundswell of progressive enthusiasm and, and activism. And I think it's probably more accurate to call what was happening in the United States Hooverism, because McCarthy was um, the best known face of the movement, but certainly FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was uh, the kind of motivating force between a lot of what was happening in the anti-communist movement. 
what was going on that that people were we, this was america we could do anything why mm-hmm. why did we think that there were communists hiding in the bushes well i think you know and this is a really interesting historical question because if you look at membership in the communist party it's declining across the 1940s so by the end of the 1940s membership in the communist party in the united states is at its lowest in american history now the fbi knew this However, the fear of communism and a kind of fear-based politics proved really um, congenial, I think that's the best word for it, to the conservative forces that were reassembling and reorganizing at war's end. They were groups of people who were very, very concerned about civil rights. They were opposed to civil rights. They were opposed to immigration. Um, They were broadly xenophobic, and they were really worried that this wave of progressive social change would undermine um, some of the privileges and entitlements that they had enjoyed prior to that. If you have an understanding of what America was like during World War II, the amount of sacrifice, personal sacrifice that went in, and everybody had gardens, and everybody had ration coupons, so you could only use so much sugar or get so much meat in a week. That's true. There were also some um, some rights that people were kind of willing to overlook uh, a very onerous government, a government that wanted a lot more control over people's behavior and their comings and goings than we think of today. And that happened at the end of World War II. There was a sense of, okay, we're done. We fought. We won. Let's get back to living our lives. And let's get back to recognizing that we are an America that is very colorful And those who had really enjoyed that control found issue with that and realized that they needed to create um, a bogeyman is the is the best the best way when you create an an opponent almost out of whole cloth. No, there it really it was true the communists were there, but they they weren't necessarily everywhere. That was just part of getting caught up in a very complex political wave in the United States. This is about power. This is about money. The war was over. America was a changed nation because everyone had a hand in the win, right? Science innovated our daily lives, and those delayed marriages of the GIs coming home. We launched the baby boom, and it began in 1946. America was growing. What you'll hear, however, is that Dr. Stabile's walk through how the spoils of a free nation, namely freedom, were never fully granted to those outside the white male power structure. Who were those people who didn't get to join in the power, in the freedom? Well, let's just call them un-American. Well, the anti-communist movement really has its roots in the first Red Scare, which is in 1919. And J. Edgar Hoover actually cuts his teeth on that first Red Scare, even though the, the and it was aimed at people who dissented. And I think that that's the constant, that the FBI and that the anti-communist forces were really, really worried about the power of critique and the power of criticism. They did not brook challenges to their authority at all. It was really a form of homegrown totalitarianism. Um, But it it, it went underground in the 1940s during the war out of expedience because the United States was allied with the Soviet Union. So it isn't until the end of World War II that the gloves come off again. And J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI begin initiating investigations and instigating investigations of progressives in education, in government, and in the entertainment industry. They begin investigating motion pictures for communist influence. In 1946, and I'm not going to talk a lot about what happened in Hollywood, but in 1946, the FBI initiated um, what they called the Common Phil Radio and Television Investigation. Common Phil was the name that the Bureau gave to a series of communist infiltration investigations. They had these common fill investigations of motion pictures, of the peace movement, of the civil rights movement. These kind of transitioned into the notorious counterintelligence programs of the 1960s, which were aimed at the American Indian movement, the Black Panther movement, and the peace movement, the anti-war movement. At any rate, in 1946, they initiate this common fill radio and television. And even though its stated purpose was to 
ferret out communist. It quickly targeted people who disagreed with this kind of rising vision of Americanism, especially when it came to civil rights, migration, peace, and interestingly enough, corporate ownership and control of media. So this was a, an attack on all those people who disagreed with the likes of J. Edgar Hoover, who again dissented with this um, rising Cold War view on an American identity. And it was so kind of over the top that there are there are many, many pages devoted to the fact that William Paley of CBS was, in fact, a member of the Communist Party, and that CBS had been so thoroughly infiltrated by communists that it was read from the very top to the people who were in the janitorial departments and stuff like this. Now, that's just kind of crazy. William Paley is a capitalist. Yes, truly. right. Yes. A very successful capitalist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he felt that CBS was the one network that was still willing to criticize U.S. foreign policy was, as it was shaping up vis-a-vis -vis the Cold War. They were also willing to criticize some of the FBI's actions. They didn't like this, and they retaliated against them quite virulently. So we have the when, the late 40s and 50s, about the time that television's impact and profitability was changing America. We have the why, which is the power, the control, the desire to minimize or eliminate the critics. We have the where, which is across the country, but most profoundly in New York and Hollywood. But let's talk a bit about the who and the what. The FBI and the Catholic Church and who else? Um, veterans organizations played a really important role, especially the American Legion, um, in publicizing and kind of supporting the attacks um, on progressive performers, directors, writers, etc. There was a very prominent member of uh, the anti-China lobby. These were industrialists who were really unhappy with what was happen happening in, in communist China. And so they wanted to get the message about anti-communism out there. And so they also funded some of these private organizations that sprang up at the end of World War II um, that became known as the clearance industry. The clearance industry, yes. Right after World War II, the sort of security state started downsizing. So, for example, the FBI had hired a lot of agents at the beginning of World War II. Um, they didn't need as many agents at the end. These men were trained FBI agents. The three men in particular that, that I've studied had worked in the New York City field office of the FBI, where their specialization was investigating communist infiltration of, of, of labor unions in particular. So at the end of World War II, these three men leave the FBI to start their own business. And of course, right after they left the FBI, the New York City field office notices that all these classified files have quote, gone missing. And Hoover immediately suspects that it's these three men who've left to start their own security firm. And indeed, they, they had stolen the files, and they used the files to set up their own business. And it was a business model that they helped develop. What they did is that they would they had these purloined files from the FBI with the, the names of people they suspected of being communists or members of the Communist Party or in some way or another subversive. They would go to a business and say, we noticed that so-and-so is working on your shop floor. They're a member of the Communist Party. We can help you clear them. And also, you should have a subscription to our new, new newsletter. And by the way, listeners, Carol is winking every time she says, we will help you clear them. Wink. <laughs> and by the way, subscribe to our newsletter. <laughs> Wink. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so they also went into businesses um, hinting that they were still working for the FBI. So even the businesses that were reluctant to do business with them were very worried that if they were still part of the FBI, that they might be retaliated against if they didn't play ball with them. So they set up their business. It was a smear and clear industry. That's what it came to be known known as in, in the industry. And um, eventually, they amassed these lengthy lists of subversives in different industries. They published one of these lists in a volume called Red Channels, the Report on Communist Influence in Radio and Television, which they promoted as the Bible of the Blacklist. That was published in June 1950. And they then mobilized people around the publication and used the publication to target 
people working in the industry. So that's kind of the genesis of the smear and clear industry. Again, the people who are working in the smear and clear industry were mostly former intelligence agents. So they had a lot of experience spying on people. Um, we know because of the FBI files that the American business cult consultants, which published Red Channels and their newsletter counterattacked, we know that they were snooping in people's mail, that they were illegally wiretapping people's phones, that they were tampering with going through their trash and things like that. So basically, they were doing everything they had done in the FBI, but they were doing it now in the interest of their business. And in fact, they were committing crimes. Yes. To, to, to snoop through somebody else's mail yes. is committing a crime. To misrepresent yes. yourself as an agent of the FBI is a crime. Yes. We're going to find out more about how the publication of Red Channels in 1950 had an immediate, like overnight, impact on the careers of TV women and of women in non-TV areas of entertainment who would have become household names had TV been allowed to create programming that showcased the true diverse talent of our great country. Think about the gaps of programming we know about that took place in the 50s. There was more to American life than Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best, and I Love Lucy. Yet those were the shows that were pumped and promoted and into syndication throughout the 70s and 80s and 90s, and now they're revered as though they really are documentaries of that time in our history. And we know better. Because even if you watched them in reruns as I did, I'm pretty sure you didn't see yourself in those shows. There was structure in the family unit and subservience and whiteness. Jeesh. I mean, the, the total dominance of the dad? Really? That wasn't our family. And that wasn't our family in the 70s and 80s, and I know for sure it wasn't earlier. But you know, that formula worked year after year, clear up to the Brady Bunch, which is sort of what made the Brady Bunch so much of a breakthrough. TV during the Red Scare steered away from controversy because there was so much money to be had. And we will learn that the ad agencies were complicit in this whole smear and clear, in these, these efforts to go to great lengths to ensure that women and persons of color and progressives, those who were not considered desirable for TV, that they weren't supported, that they weren't endorsed, that there were not going to be commercials for their shows. And all of this was based on the innuendo and lies published in Red Channels. So to be clear, the men who wrote and directed Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best, I mean, they did good work, but they didn't have this power to storytell because they were the only ones in the field. They weren't. Even then, just as it is today, the pipeline had smart, experienced women just waiting for opportunities. Those years between um, World War I and the end of World War II were a, a really amazing period for women in American history. And one of the things that I was struck by in, in reading and researching about these women is they had this deep consciousness of how different their lives were from their mother's lives. So World War I created openings that some of them took advantage of. They made moves into advertising. They were working in all these different industries that would later feed into television and having, you know, a certain amount of success. Again, I think that there was a sense of hope and optimism at the end of World War II uh, because women understood that television was going to provide all these new opportunities and that it was going to open up spaces for them that didn't exist in more mature media industries. You know, many of them had spent time in Hollywood. They were very familiar with the sexism and racism of Hollywood and, um, and understood that it was going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for them to make inroads. But television, they thought, was going to be different. And for a moment, it looked like it might be. I think about what happened in those years years is, you know, this, these kinds of doors slamming shut in their faces. Because again, these are, you mentioned, these are women who are at the top of their game, right? They're, they're not young. They're not ingenues. They've been around the business. They know the industry. They know how to get things done. They, got a, they have a certain amount of power. But then the door really does slam shut. The door slammed shut. Some of these women resurrected their careers, whether it was in film or the theater, or in a few instances, TV. The outliers, the ones who could have transformed TV through their abilities in journalism and dance or classical piano, it wasn't just a drama or comedy, they weren't just an actress sort of thing, those women receded from the public eye almost entirely. And you know, listeners, have you noticed that 
I haven't named a single name yet. And there's a reason. It's because there are 41 of them and no two situations of them are almost the same. Each one had a different story. Each one was singled out and put on that list for a different reason. But you will learn in other episodes of this season about TV women who are blacklisted and that many of them have scrubbed that whole time of being blacklisted from their careers, from their Wikipedia profiles, if indeed they even have Wikipedia profiles. And it won't surprise you that I could, in fact, recite all 41 names right now. I'll go right to Dr. Stabile's book. And maybe, maybe you'd recognize five names. It kind of depends on how old you are and how much of a film and TV buff you really are. It's an amazing field of lost talent. Talent that was never allowed to rise. Women and their families whose lives changed in an instant. And I'm not being dramatic here. Dr. Stabile tells these stories. Because for 10 years, she's cranked out request after request to the FBI asking questions that come more naturally to women than to men about what happened to these women. We're learning who these 41 were and understanding better the pain that they suffered. Listeners, I encourage you to follow Dr. Carol Stabile on Twitter. Her handle is C-A-S-T-A-B-I-L-E. You can also find it in our show notes. And learn more about the book that she's written, produced just published just last year, including where to buy it, at her website, broadcast41.com. When you go there, you're going to see your book buying options and which independent booksellers, even independent online, will send it to you. So there's another chance to make a difference if you steer away from buying just from the jungle. Before I close out this episode with a few thoughts and a clip from Lillian Hellman, who is perhaps the most well-known of the Broadcast 41, along with Dorothy Parker, I want to acknowledge the editing and creative graphics work of Catherine Yang, the theme music called Take Me Higher by Jazzer, which is found on freemusicarchive.org. And I want to assure you all that the show notes and our website, tvherstory.com, will contain the links and the book titles. Everything that I've mentioned in all four of these episodes, you'll find it at tvherstory.com. So I'll leave you with this. Thanks for listening. Now, the thoughts on Lillian Hellman, who was a distinguished author, playwright, screenwriter, raconteur, rabble-rouser. She was an intellectual celebrity of the 20s, 30s, and 40s in particular, although she lived into the 60s and 70s and was still writing and thinking and occasionally appearing on a talk show. The publication Red Channels, 1950, severely damaged the careers of Hellman and her partner, Dashiell Hammett, who was even more famous than Lillian and went to prison for six months in 1951 for contempt of Congress, all regarding the Red Scare, all about anti-communism. These two held the line. Now, I remember reading and learning about Lillian Hellman when I was in college. I was fascinated by her grit, her opinions. Her reputation in later years was that she was a cantankerous liar. Now, as we live our days today, I can't fault her for being cantankerous. Now that I fully understand better what was going on with the Red Scare, better that so many of these allegations were trumped up. So I not only can't fault her for being cantankerous, but I'm now also highly suspect as to who originally branded her a liar. But alas, Hellman was in the thick of the Red Scare and, too, was called to Washington to testify. Okay, now picture this. (laughs) The audio you're about to hear is Liza Minnelli Liza Minnelli performing the reading of Hellman's letter, which was her initial reply to the subpoena from the House Un-American Activities Committee. And it was performed in a play called Are You or Have You Ever Been in 1974? And the play was actually written two years earlier, and then it was brought to TV in 74. And, you know, there are some other things that were going on in America in 1974. There was a lot of discussion about lists and people who were liars and the public trust. Lillian Hellman wrote a letter to the chairman of the committee. Dear Mr. Wood, I am willing to testify before the representatives of our government as to my own opinions and actions regardless of any risk to myself. But I am advised by counsel that if I answer questions about myself, 
I will have waived my rights under the Fifth Amendment and could be forced legally to answer questions about others. If I refuse to do so, I can be cited for contempt. This is very difficult for a layman to understand. But there is one principle that I do understand. I am not willing, now or in the future, to bring bad trouble to people who in my past association with them were completely innocent of any talk or any action that was disloyal or subversive. To hurt innocent people in order to save myself is to me inhuman and indecent and dishonorable. I cannot and will not cut my conscience to fit this year's fashions. I was raised in an old-fashioned American tradition, and there were certain homely things that were taught to me to try to tell the truth, not to bear false witness, not to harm my neighbor, and to be loyal to my country. I respected these ideals of Christian honor and did as well with them as I knew how. It is my belief that you will agree with these simple rules of human decency and not expect me to violate the good American tradition from which they spring. I am prepared to waive the privilege against self-incrimination and tell you everything that you wish to know about my views or actions. If your committee will refrain from asking me to name other people, sincerely yours. Helm. The chairman informed. Further, there is a 1973 YouTube video of talk show host Dick Cavett interviewing Hellman, who was making the circuit promoting her book Pentimento. To be honest, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to use audio from that because he interrupts her and asks really weird questions, really demeaning questions, and I would save that all for another episode because. We're all starting to become a little bit more aware of just what behaviors have existed within the the male TV structure. Anyway, but in the end, Hellman talks about forgiveness, that there are those who made up stories during that time just to save their own hides. And she admits that there are people from that time who she will only say hello to and then move on. And in reflecting on the desires of many to move past the turbulent period, she questioned the intent behind kissing and making up, as she calls it, because then she wonders whether they really believed in what they were saying in the first place. I love Lillian Hellman. She was a deep thinker. Stay tuned for our next installment of TV Women Blacklisted on Advanced TV History. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams.